for many years, and for my most uh, impressionable years and formative years, what I really did was uh, being a listener. I listened for hours and hours to the Rebbe's words, and our job was to then, especially because it was Shabbos or the holidays, there were no notes taken and no recordings made, so we had to actually, from memory, almost verbatim, recreate six, seven hours of these talks. And that was what I did. So I spoke very little and listened a lot. It's not always comfortable to stand up and therefore speak. And yet, uh, probably many of you know me more as a speaker than as a listener, but I will tell you that the secret of speaking is listening. And even though I'm standing up here with, at the mic, but the truth is, as I learned from the Rebbe, and I hope we all can learn that, that the real art is to get yourself out of the way and try to be a transparent channel and transparent communicator of a truth that's greater than yourself. And if each of us was able to do that, we would have a far better world, far better life, far better relationships, So even though I'm being the speaker here, I will try to channel what I learned and what I absorbed over the many years. Many of these things perhaps are truths that you're already aware of. But it never hurts to go back to the fundamental principles that make us all tick. You know, why are we here in this world? What is our mission? And get beyond the immediate need for survival to get to a point of understanding the great contribution that each of us can make in this lifetime. So I want to begin with a story that actually I was inspired watching the video now. So this is more of a story that I'd like to share about a young man growing up in uh, Crown Heights, USA, in the environment where the Rebbe lived and the Rebbe led the Chabad and the world Jewish community. And like all young people, I'm sure you all remember when you were a little younger, going through his own uh, dilemmas and challenges. And um, actually, even though he grew up in the Chabad community and the Chabad schools, nevertheless, he was of the rebellious sort, meaning he did not just accept what everybody was telling him he was not good at listening to authorities, and he was a nonconformist. And he was a troublemaker to some extent. Only thing is he was smart enough not to get expelled from the schools, so he like lived on that edge, and he would challenge in himself personally. He went through many dilemmas in the context of what is this whole thing being a Jew? What does it mean to be a religious Jew, an observant Jew, a chassid? And though the Rebbe was the king on the hill, which means he respected him, but he didn't have a personal relationship. And it wasn't easy because there wasn't many people to speak to. I don't know what kind of schools you all went to, but uh, the school he went to, which was a Chabad school, not all questions were always accepted. Certain things were seen as being too uh, sacrilegious, too irreverent. Anyway, long story short, he's going through his own struggles. And then once he's at a Fabrengen, and the Rebbe is speaking about exactly this topic, the rebellion in young people. He was actually talking about the 60s in America, which is known for its rebellious stage of the young rising and challenging the establishment. And the Rebbe said something which caught his attention, and that was this, that most people think when young people rebel and they challenge the system and they challenge their parents and their authorities and their teachers and educators, that it's considered something really dangerous even, or, you know, we'll tolerate it until they grow up and manage. But it's not considered as a positive thing. And the Rebbe said that's a grave error. The rebellion of young people is actually the fire in the soul, the fire in the belly of that young person, man or woman, who wants to 
changed the world, but is frustrated and doesn't know how. Is looking for ways to change the status quo. So that's why they're rebellious, and that's why they challenge. So it would be wise for adults, and I'm paraphrasing, the Rebbe spoke, of course, in Yiddish. It would be wise for adults, if they can't be of help to get out of the way, but if they want to be of help, to use their seasoning and their experience and their maturity to help young people channel this energy toward a spiritual revolution. Because it's basically unbridled fire. And fire can be destructive, but it could also be a tremendous force for change. And it struck this young man because he never heard anything like that. Actually, coming from a Rebbe, a Hasidic Rebbe that stereotypical newspapers would say, an ultra-Orthodox rabbi from a primitive, archaic world, speaking in a more, if you can say, hip and fashionable way than most of his own contemporaries. And it ignited something in this young man. And ultimately, he made the commitment to become one of these revolutionaries, to join this movement. And realized that the Rebbe, though he was dressed up in Hasidic garb, in traditional Judaism, was truly a pioneer, a revolutionary, a trailblazer, who's here to change the world and not accept the status quo and do everything possible to create a real revolution. So it perfectly fit in to what this young man, looking back, could say was he was like a rebel without a cause. He found his cause. This young man is standing before you tonight. That's me. At that stage, without going into all, I'm not going to share a confession of all my uh, sins, but I will say that what I discovered and never looked back was that I began to look closer at these teachings called firstly the Torah and especially through the lens of the Rebbe. The lens of the Rebbe through the, uh, the teachings of Hasidus and the more this young man, or I now can say myself, the more I studied, the more I recognized the resonance, I would even call it the music and the poetry of uh, Judaism and its absolute indispensable relevance to life today. There's nothing more compelling than that, especially for a young person. And that's when I made the commitment over time to become part of this, what I did was I decided, you know what, I want to access to this man called the Rebbe. And how do you have access is get involved in what he's teaching. So I was very tr intrigued by the groups that people, young group, young small group of young people get, gathering together every Saturday night after Shabbos when you can write down notes and trying to remember what the Rebbe said. And I became part of that group. And I became better at it. And ultimately I became the main writer, as was mentioned in 1979 and had direct access, be able to ask the Rebbe questions. The Rebbe edited many of these talks. And I can tell you, I exploited the opportunity to the fullest. You have access like that. I asked everything. Every time I could find some way to ask a question, whether it's about the Holocaust or about some other theological or Kabbalistic or Hasidic idea, I was there. And sometimes you got, uh, you got it over your head, but it was worth it. It was worth it because we were able to extract. And the Rebbe, I could see, he actually enjoyed it. He enjoyed, I wouldn't say we was challenged, we didn't challenge with respect, but still the Rebbe enjoyed when a question, when, uh, when he said something and it wasn't just taken for granted. As a matter of fact, the Rebbe would insist that he said, I said something intentionally and it took 20 years for somebody to realize that I contradicted myself. And I was looking for someone to see if it would provoke them to ask. So I took that seriously, and I took full advantage. I wish I did even more than I did, but I can tell you, because of that, many, many ideas of the Rebbe were fleshed out even more than the Rebbe initially even expressed them. And I'm not saying this to toot my horn, I'm saying it actually just to demonstrate, give you a personal taste of an interaction. Now, of course, the Rebbe is the Rebbe. Everything was done very professionally in writing. It wasn't in person. But it was fascinating, and I will share some of those uh, interactions in my few words here that um, both are insightful, also in the human, the human touch, the human connection, that besides the Rebbe's uh, goenus and brilliance and scholarship 
And of course, piety and level of holiness that's beyond what uh, humans like us can fathom. There was also the human side, the humorous side, and the wit. All obviously, not just in any, God forbid, frivolous way, but ways that helped me and helped everybody that the Rebbe came in contact with. And by extension to everyone else that we reach, help become a better person. Help you fulfill the mission for which you were created. And um, with that said, I felt maybe we should choose a few central themes that I would even say they're transforma transformative principles that the Rebbe introduced, which on one hand are not actually original or new, because as we all know, real truths are not new. There was that professor who spent half his life writing a magnum opus of his contributions, and then he presented it to the wizards of the world to give their assessment, and they all came back with a consensus. They all unanimously agreed that his paper, his thesis was good and original. So he was delighted to hear such type of uh, recognition and uh, validation from the greatest minds of the world. They said, but there was one problem. The part that was good wasn't original, and the part that was original wasn't good. You know? So the deepest truths of life are actually not that original. They're with us all the time. They're within us all the time. But what is original is for someone to help reveal it. It's exactly the theme we just heard described by the few individuals. The truest truths are not something that someone gives you. They're there all the time, but you either don't see them or there are too many blocks and too many impediments. What's so beautiful about that is that it's about you. It's not about the leader. It's not about the teacher. And there are very few people in the world, if any, to find a mentor like that, that can completely help you see yourself the way you are meant to be, not just what you are, what you're capable of, is a great gift. And the Rebbe was that for anyone who came in contact with him, and I include myself as one. But it's not an accident that there are thousands and thousands of Chabad emissaries all around the world today. You know, everyone asks the same question. I've been asked this year and last year. Every year, this time, Gimel Tammuz, the journalist, come out. And how is it possible that Chabad should be functioning, let alone thriving, without a CEO? Is there such a thing as a company, a business, an organization, entity that without a CEO, without its leader, physically there, can, can be run for a week? Even with leaders, it barely runs properly. And here it is 25 years, and 27 years if you take into account the Rebbe's stroke. And the short answer really is very straightforward. And always, everyone I say it to, every journalist, they, they're taken aback, but then they immediately react very positively. The answer is that Chabad is not a company, and the Rebbe is not a CEO. This isn't a business. It's not even a non-for-profit business. It's a spiritual revolutionary movement that began thousands of years ago. And the same question can be asked, how are the Jews here after thousands of years with oh, most of those years, no country and no money and no empire and no army and no defense and actually being oppressed? The answer is because there's something eternal that beats in our chests and is captured and personified and embodied in the Torah. And those Torah people, people, who could dedicate their lives to be walking Taurus, it's not about them. They then get connected to something that's eternal that does not die. And what the Rebbe did in his lifetime, which continues to do right now, is the same thing. Touching anyone that came touch contact with him, touching their hearts and souls, and igniting something that want, they want to become part of creating a revolution. The Rebbe created leaders. Therefore, there's not one Chabad rabbi that has quit. Everyone feels ownership in what they do. And it's something that can itself be a whole study in leadership. How do you inspire someone on that level? That you're not even there physically. You're not even there, so to speak, to the person to be accountable to you, unless they want to be. You can't impose yourself on them. And yet, they're continuing doing their job, the best of their ability. We all make our mistakes. But we're there. So the answer is that the Rebbe, when he touched the people, whoever it was, 
30 years ago, 40 years ago, 50 years, 60 years ago, he touched them in the deepest part of their heart and soul when they were young, and they never looked back. That is something very rare, maybe impossible even to imagine because no one else has ever done that. But I think it's important to articulate something that's not really always emphasized. What is the secret to the eternity? Because it's not about us humans. It's about God. And God works through people. And when people allow themselves to get their egos out to the side and their own agendas and prejudices, they too become a channel for eternity. That's why we say not only Hashem is eternal, but Am Yisrael Chai. I remember two days after Gimel Tamas, 25 years ago. So we were all younger people then. That same night, it was a Tuesday night. Gimel Tamas that year was Saturday night, Sunday. And Tuesday night, I was interviewed by two major interviews, one by Larry King on CNN, and that same night by Charlie Rose on PBS. And Larry King asked me this question. He said, he said, the Rebbe is 92 years old. I understand you're all saddened, Chabad, Hasidim, and all his followers and disciples, and, uh, and uh, the ones that respect the Rebbe, but why are you shocked? Everybody dies. Why are you shocked that a 92-year-old man died? That was his question. Now, this was all live TV. I didn't have time to prepare, and it was also under the emotional little anguish of two days after Gimel Thomas. So you just speak from your gut. So I responded. I said, look, for us, the Rebbe embodied Torah. And Torah is here with us for thousands of years. Torah is immortal. So when mortality touches the mortal, it's not just sad. It's also shocking. Now, there was always in the studio, there was always someone to rebut you. You know, the other's opinion. So the other guy sitting there, you know, Larry King turned to him. Actually, there was a break in between. No, I should there was a break. So he says to me, he was sitting there with me, he says to me, immortality, are you kidding me? So I said, listen, you're going to have your chance now. You can say anything you like. He says, no, no, no. First of all, the sympathies are with you. Second of all, how am I supposed to rebut that? I'm going to say the Rebbe did not embody the Torah, you know? So he couldn't really, he just nodded along and went along. My point is that this isn't, that what I just said is not something shocking. It's not something that is uh, politically incorrect. It's simply a fact. And now the proof is in the pudding, and you see it. That is why it lives on. So though we are all, as I said, we all have our mistake flaws and we're not perfect human beings, but we have the ability to commit to something that's greater than ourselves. And when that thing is immortal, which means God and God's Torah and God's mission in this world, that does not die. And Chabad is a living, breathing example of that. In its own way, inspiring people who I meet all the time who are born after they're younger than 25 years old. They're going out who knows where. You can't figure out. They never saw the Rebbe in their life. They only saw videos. And they heard stories. And they read his teachings. Because when it touches you in that place, it doesn't matter. It has that power. So how can we translate this into a force that can help us in our personal lives? So here I want to go over five points there are many, many more, but I think these five really capture, in words, so many ways what the Rebbe really contributed to a generation, which, must be mentioned, is also a post-Holocaust generation. When the Rebbe assumed leadership in 1950, you think of the morale and the mood and the environment of the Jewish people. 1950, five years after six of 18 million Jews were decimated, and the rest, the 12 million that remained, were in complete disarray. How many orphans and widows and widowers were roaming around Europe with nowhere to go, nobody wanted them. And America wasn't exactly, Judaism was thriving. Assimilation was ravaging the Jews that lived there. How many teachers, how many rabbis, how many community leaders were taken? So you can imagine a mood like that, you'd think, you know what, let's lick our wounds and let's just figure out how to manage. No, the Rebbe did not. He had a whole game plan, a game plan to go on the offense. It was almost considered insane by some people. You know, what do you do when you have a remnant? You have people who don't know language. They don't have money. They have no families left. And this wasn't just Europe, Russia, wherever you go. The Jews were, 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 were probably 
one of the lowest points in our history. To turn that into an offense requires some vision beyond one that's describable, but the fact is that he did it. So I want to share one story, and with that I'll go into these five points, which I think are the driving ethos, the driving principles that capture so much of what the Rebbe st stood for and what he gave us as the greatest gift to the human race, not just to the Jewish people, to the human race. So 19, 15, 10 years earlier, 1940, in the middle of World War II, middle of the Holocaust, the Rebbe's father-in-law, who the Rebbe repeated the Rebbe, his name who knows how many times in, in his talks. His connection to his father-in-law, you could sense was his own, where he got his energy from, so to speak. So the Friedrich Rebbe, Rabbi Yosef Yitzhak Schneerson, arrives to America on a boat, literally from Nazi Europe, one of the last to leave, Middle of the Holocaust, 1940 we're talking about. 12 difficult, arduous days on a ship. Comes to New York. They take him to the Greystone Hotel. And um, that's where he stayed for a while until they found more permanent residence. It would be a little later that 770 Eastern Parkway was purchased and became central headquarters later that year. So everyone thought the Rebbe would want to rest after such a long journey on his own. And remember, the Rebbe's coming off a boat. Today we have videos in a wheelchair. He wasn't well physically. It was very obvious. Besides the psychological and emotional burden of his own brothers and sisters, his people, his flock, being massacred. So everyone thought he'd want to rest. No, the Rebbe wants to say a few words. I was so taken by this uh, scene, I actually asked people who were living witnesses Rabbi Yitzchak Groner was one of them, all of us shalom. And some others that I was able to access at the time. And the Rebbe's sitting there in his chair, and he's speaking to a group of maybe 20, 25 people in the Greystone Hotel, the outer room, and he says the following. He says, and with a whole adamance, with a whole chutzpah, with a whole um, pride, I did not come here to save myself. I actually didn't want to come here. I would have stayed with my people. God brought me here to demonstrate that America is not different and that we're going to recreate everything that we had in the old home and even greater, that there'll be yeshivas and there'll be schools and there'll be mikvahs and there'll be kosher and there'll be little Jewish children running around proud to be Jewish with that whole type of strength that the Rebbe Friedrich Rebbe projected. The people, each one that I spoke to, they said they felt like the Friedrich Rebbe was speaking to a million people. Afterwards, and we know this from the Friedrich Rebbe's diary, and here you'll see what a leader is. Afterwards, a few of the Rebbe Chassidim who were there and supporters, I wanted to come in and say a few words to the Rebbe. So he led them into his room, and they said, Rebbe, we just heard what you said, and we want to tell you because of our love for you and our great respect for you and your holy father and your holy grandfather and your holy great grandfather that this is not going to happen. We want the Rebbe to realize and want the Rebbe to become disappointed to lower his expectations. We want to just tell you this is not realistic. This is not reality. And out of respect, this was like not people challenging the Rebbe. They're saying it's just it's not, it's not, you know. And uh, the Friedrich Rebbe writes in his diary the following in Yiddish. He says, "Man kann sich vorstellen, die Tränen waren sein Gegossen von meiner Eigen, der erste Nacht, was ich mir gewöhnt habe, von Amerikaner Boden. You could imagine the tears that poured from our eyes, my eyes, hearing this from my friends, the first night that I came to American soil. Now, obviously, and thank God, the Friedrich Rebbe did not listen to these uh, consultants and advisors. He did what he had to do, and therefore, no surprise that his son-in-law." who came a year later, also out of Nazi Europe, took exactly the same attitude. In 1950, when, his, when the Friedrich Rebbe passed on, the Rebbe took the leadership and did exactly what the Friedrich Rebbe began doing. But we have a little glimpse into the eyes of our Rebbe, into a visionary. The number one is they're not here to uh, placate anybody and they're not here to tow anyone's line. They're here to change the world. And they come with the power of Hashem, with God and the Torah. And when you have that, you are formidable. 
nothing can stop you. And there's no difference if you're in a wheelchair or if you're weak. Or even in the middle of a Holocaust, the six million Jews, Rahman al Islam, were taken. You forge ahead. Doesn't mean we're not in pain, doesn't mean we're not sad, we're not in denial. But how do you channel that grief? You channel into transformation. So with that stage being set, 1950, the Rebbe assumes leadership, and we see it in his words, because the Rebbe was a man of words, where it's all documented today, recorded. You can listen to it, you can watch it. I, a person who's done my whole life, I've been dedicated to this. I study it all the time, because it's me, it's not just a nice understanding of the Torah and interpretations in Chumash and Bible or Rambam or Zohar or Kabbalah and other Sfarim. Halacha. It's actually a tremendous and maybe an unprecedented story of human history. And while you're living it, you don't always appreciate it. But when you step back a bit and you share it with others, you suddenly realize, wow, this is something mind-blowing. And we're going to spend 20, on the 25th year of the Rebbe of Gimel Tammuz, what better tribute is there to actually articulate this power and how it affects us personally. So here are the five things I want to share with you. I'll give you an acronym. You always want acronyms. It's not the great acronym, but I, it's better than nothing, okay? For the memory. So today, iPods are popular, right? So this is my pod, M-I-P-O-D. That's the acronym. I present the acronym of five letters. Mission, initiative, persistence, opportunities, and destination. M-I-P-O-D. So let's start with this. Um, you don't need to be a big businessman to know. Business 101 is what's the first thing you need if you're going to start a new business or a new organization or a new entity. That is, you need to have a mission. They call it a mission statement, a vision statement, a mission statement. Now, if someone were to tell you, listen, I want to start a business, I would like your investment, and you say, okay, what's your mission? And they say to you, well, we haven't developed one yet. Or I have a bunch of options. Or it's so long, I don't know if you have the patience to sit here and listen to it. What would be your attitude to that? I don't know if you'd kick them out pleasantly or unpleasantly, but you're definitely not investing with someone who doesn't have a mission. Either. Forget about infrastructure and how you're going to implement and execute that's the basis thing. You have to have a mission. So let me ask you a question. I've asked this to thousands and thousands of people in audiences around the world. If a company cannot function without a mission statement, it would seem logical that a human being shouldn't be able to function without a mission statement. What is your personal mission in life? What do most people answer? You know what they answer? Some say to make money. With that, I can buy anything. Some say to be happy. And some say to build a nice family, a nice Jewish family a family that will perpetuate Jewish tradition. All those are beautiful, right? Who doesn't want to make money and be happy and perpetuate, build a good, beautiful family? But they don't all, they're all beautiful, but they don't qualify as mission statements. It'd be the equivalent of a company saying, our mission is to make money. You never see that in a mission statement. Our mission is that all our employees should be happy, or that we should perpetuate certain values. Every company will have a very short, sweet, one or two line mission statement that's unique to them and will always serve something greater than the company serves itself. So take Google. You've heard of Google? Good. It's a joke. I, who didn't hear of Google? So Google's mission statement is to organize all the information of the world and make it readily accessible. That's it. 80,000 employees, billions and billions of dollars of revenue driven by a one line like that. Initially, you'd think, well, what's, what's the big thing to organize information readily accessible? Yeah, but you know what? When 90% results in the Google search result what you want, you keep coming back, and advertisers will pay money as they're paying. So it's not about making money. The money is an outgrowth of fulfilling a mission. The mission is to serve a need that's not about them, a need of people to find information. You go across mission statements. I've studied many mission statements. They all fit the same category. So therefore, when someone asks you, what's your personal mission, it's not enough to say to be happy, make money, and be, uh, build a good family. That's generic. That's too generic. You have to include in it what is unique about you 
and your faculties and your skills, your skill set, and how are you using it in some way to improve life? And if you don't do that, that's not a mission. So then you'll say, one second, I'm living half my life, and I don't have a mission, and I'm doing pretty well. Why is it that uh, it's necessary? The answer is, you know why you're doing well? First of all, who defines what well is? A company can't afford that statement because there's a thing called accountability. If you're not going to have a mission or you're not going to live up to your mission, the company will start failing. Even running a company with two people is difficult. Imagine hundreds of people. The inefficiency, the lack of focus, the waste of resources, the misdirection of, of resources will take its toll. And money talks, and the debtors will come knocking at the door. In our own personal lives, we don't necessarily have such accountability. Who are we answering to? If my life is not working, who cares except me? And I convince myself it is working. That's the difference. The difference is that in a business, there are real benchmarks and criteria. So the first and single most thing in a person's life, and this I could say is literally an undercurrent of almost every line of the Rebbe's words, is that we were sent to this world on a mission. We didn't fall here by accident. We didn't, uh, it's not so, it's like, a, in, I don't know where in the United States there's a son, a boy, a young man, he's suing his parents. Literally suing his parents because they brought him in this world without asking him permission. How they were supposed to do that exactly, we don't know. But now he's suing for all expenses of his entire life. I didn't ask to be brought here. You brought me here. You gotta pay for everything. It's already been resolved, he lost. He didn't realize that his parents are both uh, attorneys, you know. So they had it all figured out. They had it all, you know. So he's suing. We are sent into this world on a mission, on a purpose. And this is why you hear the word shlichus. It's used so often we don't even appreciate it. Shlichus. What do you think the word shlichus means? A shliach. It means you're an emissary. You're not here just to be here. You were sent here. You were put here for a reason. Are you living up to the reason you came to this world? And it's a question that the Rebbe would pose, that a person should ask themselves literally every moment of their lives, every morning at least. Not to make us feel guilty and so on. On the contrary, it's empowering. It means that the world needs you and God felt it necessary to put you here because you have a mission to accomplish that you and only you can accomplish. I remember once, more than once, but I remember once at a Fabrengen. Fabrengen, the Rebbe would sit in a room, thousands of people all over. If you've ever been there, you know what I mean. If not, you see it on the videos. And I remember once the Rebbe of Fabrengen, it was, I think, Shabbos, and the Rebbe said this line, he said, every person, and I remember the, rarely the Rebbe looked around in the middle of his talk, but he looked around for that moment, and he said, everyone, every individual, has a mission to fulfill that you and only you can accomplish. You know how empowering that is? Seven and a half billion people on this planet, most of us don't think we are that significant. We don't. You know, it's like sand, a, 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 um, a grain of sand on a beach. How significant is it? But then you hear you were chosen. You were chosen by Hashem, by God. He took your soul from a very spiritual place sent it to this material world with all its challenges because you have something to accomplish that no one else can accomplish but you. So you can imagine that the Rebbe meeting any person that was always on his mind. John, Rabbi Sachs just said it. We heard on the video. Ask anyone. That was always the question. The Rebbe said, so what are you doing with your life? There was never a situation where the Rebbe, yeah, people ask the Rebbe for blessings and for this. The Rebbe always turned it around. So what are you accomplishing? In a positive way, an empowering way. So number one is a mission-driven life, and the exact opposite of that, I think is pretty obvious what it is, was a life driven by circumstances. We react, which leads me to point number two. We are reactive people. Someone has a demand, makes a demand, you respond. Whether it's a spouse, whether it's at work, whether it's whatever, initiate to be proactive and not a reactive person. Now in any situation you're in, you need to initiate, you're not there to be influenced, you're there to influence. My father was a journalist and he would always tell me this line, he says there are three types of people. People who make things happen, people who watch things happen, 
and people will ask what happened. So which one are you? And today, especially with the media, we're all, we're all uh, voyeurs. We're all um, watching other people do things. The Rebbe said, you have to make things happen. There was a man called Shimshon Stock in Crown Heights. Um, he was like a, like Milton Tevye the milkman type of guy, the Crown Heights Tevye, you know, those that knew him. He told me once the story that when he was a young man, a bocher, a student, it was the mid-50s, mid-40s rather, and the Rebbe, the Rebbe, who was then known as the Ramash, he wasn't Rebbe yet, he um, would study with him 15 minutes or a half hour every Saturday night after Shabbos. Gemara they learned. He wasn't a great student, and the Rebbe showed a way to help encourage him, inspire him. Anyway, one Saturday night comes around, and uh, the Rebbe's there, and the guy doesn't show up. Shimshon's not there. The Rebbe goes out on the porch in front of 770. He's looking to see. And there he sees Shimshon's running to the subway station. In front of 770, there's a subway station. Kingston Eastern Parkway. And the Rebbe motions to him. He comes over and he says to the Rebbe, I can't study tonight. There's something I must do, very important. The Rebbe said, what's more important than learning Torah? I can't tell you, but it's more important. The Rebbe said, it's not fair. I've already given time. I've, I've committed my time with you. At least tell me what's more important. So he says, well, the Brooklyn Dodgers are playing the New York Yankees. There's the two baseball teams in the United States. And uh, here it's a form of uh, what, cricket is the closest thing to it. American baseball, which um, is an Americanized version, yes. Perfect for commercials and advertisements and all of that. And that time, in the 1940s, a team called the Brooklyn Dodgers were based in Crown Heights, actually. A place called Ebbets Field, now Bedford and Crown. Now it's apartment buildings. In 1955, they moved to Los Angeles. They're the Los Angeles Dodgers today. So they were playing the New York Yankees, which was considered a big uh, rivalry because this is Brooklyn, New York. And he's going to the game. And then the Rebbe says to, and he says to the Rebbe, and by the way, if the Rebbe wants, if you want to come along, I can get an extra ticket. <laughs> the Rebbe declined, smiled, and said to him, let me ask you, how much, is the, how much are these tickets? So what did it cost back in the 40s? Seven cents, 10 cents, whatever it was. So the Rebbe said, let me understand something. You're spending 10 cents, which was a lot of money then, relatively, to do what? To go to a stadium to watch other people play a game. And I'm offering you to be a player in the game for free. I don't know if he understood at the time. He told me, I don't know if I understood at the time, but I still rejected his uh, offer. And you know what? It's now 60 years later, and I'm still watching other people play the game. And I never became a player in the game. I don't know if that's completely correct, but that's what he said about himself. So that's called an initiator. We live in a world that's very easy to be a bystander. We call it observant Jew. You're observing others. And the Rebbe, that was not acceptable. Initiate. Initiate doesn't always mean a dramatic revolution in the world, something radical. It could be in a simple situation. Instead of saying, I don't know what to do, you initiate. You say, let's, let's start something. Maybe start a new class, invite someone, you're commuting, you're sitting there, a stranger, share a good word, send a nice email, use social media for a positive purpose. There, you just have to apply yourself, but it's a different way of thinking. It's not just a difference, okay, I'm initiating. It's a different way of thinking. Are you an initiator or are you just a reactive person? Now, obviously, when you're driven by a mission, it's a lot easier to initiate. So that's point number two. Number three, persistence. I was a boy, I was 10 years old, in Crown Heights, as I mentioned, and um, it was Sukkot, Sukkot. Sukkot, in those years, the Rebbe had a custom, he would have a Fabrengen twice during the holiday, well, more than twice, but twice in the Sukkot. And uh, that particular Sukkot, 1966, Tavshin Chav was uh, torrential rains, like when I landed here, more or less. But it was seven days in a row. So raining and raining and raining. I, that I remember. There was a Fabreng in, in one of those rainy... Were you there, Sukhub Zayin Sukkot? Rabbi? Yeah? Okay. Now, a Chabad Sukkot, as you may know, has very thick layers of evergreens. 
So that's very good at the beginning of a rain, because till, they get, till the rain gets to you, it takes a while. But it's not good once it gets saturated, because then the globs start coming down, very uncomfortable. You know, you're sitting there, and here suddenly a glob comes down your neck, and here's down your this and down that. So here we are, Sukkis, the Rebbe's sitting there. I come, I'm a little kid, I couldn't hear the Rebbe, but I see the scene. The Rebbe's sitting there, completely oblivious to the rain. Everybody else is there out of respect to the Rebbe. And um, I, don't, I can't say what I remember as a ch I remember the scene. I don't know what I said and processed it. But in retrospect, I'll tell you what it left, the impression it left on me, that never, that uh, till this day. Here's a man he's sitting in a pouring rain. We have a thing called, in the world, it's called a rain date. If it's raining, you reschedule for tomorrow, for the next day. And now, they weren't eating a meal. It wasn't like they had to be sitting in the sukkah. If the Rebbe wanted, he could have had a bring it inside the building. So they won't say l'chaim. But no, this is what the Rebbe did on sukkahs. It rains, doesn't make a difference. This is what you do. It's not a mitzvah to be sitting in the sukkah then, but that's not going to stop a fabrengen. What I learned from that is the relentless pursuit to the point of absolute persistence of something good, and you never stop. There's many things to say. I'll tell you, the Rebbe said a mimer then. Everyone thought a mimer, and the Rebbe had a certain sense of humor. What was the mimer that year, 1966? Veshaft the mimer of course, which is a sukkah's mimer, but I, I don't think the Rebbe would, you know, that when you, go, you draw water with joy. The point is persistence, that you never cease. I remember one of the summer months, my parents once rented a house not far from New York, by the ocean, not too far so my father could go to work. So I would go there in the evenings, I was already a student in yeshiva, so I would go there sometimes for um, my mother's dinner. You know that feeling, right? Um, anyway, sometimes I'd go out to the beach, and I remember one night staying there all night, watching the beach, you know, these young, ideological, naive uh, people like myself, and I'm watching the beach and the relentless waves. And I said, maybe the waves will stop for a moment. I'm going to stay all night and see if it ever stops. And it never stopped. And I learned something. And the this talks a lot about how nature, there's miracles that happen. Those that happen sporadically. But nature, nature has a certain relentlessness to it. Leisure based it, that never rests. And when you think about it, that in a way is even a greater miracle. Because it never ceases. Those waves reminded me the power of the relentless of the Rebbe. Persistence. The unbelievable persistence. The patience necessary. The commitment necessary. Because we all have moments where, you know, you're under the weather, you're over the weather, you're not in the mood. Now, obviously, the Rebbe was not subject to those whims. But that relentlessness and sitting with people who were subject to such whims and vicissitudes, and the Rebbe never ceased. It was like a never ceasing power. Now that captures you when you see it. It affected me because later, years later, when I started a class, I remember a class I still give till this day, Wednesday night class. As a matter of fact, I, I recorded one because I was coming here, so I recorded it before I left. So it's 1982. There are many excuses I had that I could have stopped it, but I never forgot the reign of Sukkot 1966, which was one of many examples of persistence. You start something, you never stop. How many things have we started? Whatever, we stopped. You cannot imagine that power. Everyone knows the story of Rabbi Kiva, the relentless power of a drop after a drop of drop of water that affected him so deeply. When he saw a stone that was born through, like drilled through, and he wondered, how did a hole like that born through a stone? And he realized there were drops of water from a, a, a river or a little brook nearby. Drop after drop after drop. The negative of it is, everyone knows, Chinese war to torture. But the positive is, is, is the power of consistency. It's not even how much you do, but it's consistent. We call kvies item letter. It's not how much you learn, but it's consistent. You have a schedule, and that is a chain, that is the power to change worlds. So that's number three, persistence. Opportunities. It was uh, Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur, 1989. My father, who had a close relationship with the Rebbe, relatively, spent many hours with the Rebbe. It's a whole other fabrengen of its own. I can talk about that. 
That year, my father suffered a mini stroke, and he ended up Rosh Hashanah and Kippur in the hospital. I was called by the secretary of the Rebbe that the Rebbe wants to see me. So I went by the Rebbe's room, and the Rebbe gave me, it was Erev Yom Kippur, the day before Yom Kippur, so the custom is lekach, which is sweet honey cake. The Rebbe gave me a piece of honey cake and said, give this in Yiddish, give this to your father, you should have a sweet year. And Zogem, as at Farendik and Zayn Shlichis, Favas Mitam Geshikt in Shpital, that Menemares Lozen. That when he'll finish the mission for which he was sent to the hospital, he'll be released. So I immediately ran to the hospital. My mother was there, my father's lying there. I give him the cake, I tell him what the Rebbe said. My mother starts running around and doing Mifzoyim and she's talking to this one. My father calls her back and says, Listen, I'm the one in the hospital, it's my mission. You're my guest, you know, you're my wife. And my father did whatever he had to do, just to show you that it wasn't a joke. The day after Yom Kippur, Rabbi Chadakov, the Rebbe's chief of staff, his main secretary, shows up at the hospital to visit my father. And he says that the Rebbe is asking, did you finish your shlichus yet? Did you finish your mission here? Now tell me something. Who wants to go to hospitals? God forbid. Nobody wants to be in a hospital. The only reason he was there because he had a stroke. He had no choice, especially Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur. The Rebbe looks at it this way. No, everything is an opportunity. It's true, the ostensible reason you were brought there is because of the illness. But now that you're there, you're not just a victim. You're not just here to be healed. You're here to achieve something that only you can achieve because you're in this situation. Can you imagine thinking like that? Now, obviously, a man on a mission who takes initiative with persistence is going to think like that. But it's a whole different way of looking at things. Now you think so something that we're not capable of? I see people very capable of it in their own selfish way. You look at heads of businesses, you see them at a conference, you see them at a reception, you see them in any event, they're always looking for opportunities. Everyone they meet, immediately they think, how could this person be a resource? How can this person be a vendor or a customer or a client? How could I uh, cross-pollinate with them? Why? Because someone, running, someone who owns something and is driven 24-7 for its success is going to look at everything as an opportunity. Even a liability is an opportunity. And the Rebbe taught us to be opportunists like that. Here, I was traveling, I was once invited for a Shabbaton in uh, East Hampton, New York. You've heard of this place? Yeah, so there's um, Chabad Shleir there, Rabbi Baumgarten. I'm driving Friday afternoon. I stopped for gasoline, gas. Is that what they call it in this country? Gas? Petrol. Petro. Yeah, I knew there was some other word. But you all know what the, get the idea. Okay. I stopped there, and uh, there's a, uh, I finished filling up my car. You say a car? Huh? Or is there another word for that? I know a trunk in, in England is called a uh, boot. What's it called here? Okay. Fine. Um, Maybe if we have time, I'll tell you about my theory of Australian and South African-American uh, English accents. I've developed a theory around that. But that's for later. So I fill up my car. I'm about to leave. There's a guy there in the parking lot right near the gas station, petrol station, whatever you call it. And uh, he asked me if I'm staying for the party. He's parking cars. So I said, no, I'm going to another party. What kind of party are you going to? I said, it's called a Friday night, a Shabbos party. So he, says to me, he asked me, started asking me questions. He was very intrigued. A 17, 18-year-old kid. So I answered him. And then he's saying to me, do you, what do you do? I told him, I teach, I write. You have an email list? Yes, put me on your email list. Fine. I do it. I go off to East Hampton. I come back to New York, to home. I give my office the email. Um, okay, I, I, I didn't forget the story, but I never thought I'd hear, hear from this guy. Well, I did. Over almost seven years later, I get an email from him. He says, you probably don't remember me. I was the 70 year old guy, parking attendant, parking cars, and we had this conversation, and ever since I've been receiving your emails. And um, I have to tell you that I'm Jewish. Completely never went to any Jewish schools. I actually suffered a great tragedy. My parents were killed in a car accident when I was very young, so I was Moved from one home to another, a nightmare of a childhood. But your emails became my Jewish lifeline. And he starts listing. 
He doesn't go to synagogue, but what he does is Friday night, he reads the email, he prays with it, he studies it, he starts telling me about Hanukkah and about Yutas Kislev and about Pesach, and he tells me even the little tidbits I saw. I mean, he's, he's, he's serious. And I said to myself, wow, this is like something that resonated, reminded me of something the Rebbe so often talked about technology, how it's an opportunity, talk about opportunities. That technology, for most of us, it's a nice luxury. It's leisurely, it's uh, you know, fun. You can connect with anyone. The Rebbe, an opportunity. What would be the chances for this young man to come to New York to a class that I was giving or someone else was giving? Almost zilch, he would not do that. But here, just added him to a list without an extra press of a button, without a penny, any course, the same email that went to thousands of others he received as well, and look what happened to his life. After that, I can tell you I became an email junkie. I started like, you know, hoarding emails wherever I go, because I realized it's such an easy way to maintain a relationship with someone, and also teaches you technology is not just for us to do business, or for nonsense, or for entertainment. It's an opportunity to reach people. And that's how the Rebbe saw it with a clear vision. It's opportunity, unprecedented opportunity, to reach millions, if not billions, of people with a kind word. That's called opportunity. So whether it's a negative experience or a positive one, it's always an opportunity for some growth. And finally, the D. Remember, M-I-P-O-D, Mission, Initiative, Persistence, Opportunity, and Destination. Now, destination, what is that exactly? I'll let you in on a secret, but with a little uh, story. One of my classes that I gave years ago was uh, the core group of people from the arts and entertainment industry. And um, they were all spiritual people, many Jews, some non-Jews, but mostly Jewish. But their spirituality, if you ask them where it came from, not from traditional sources. They would say something like uh, Zen Buddhism, or a thing called, if I may, Rabbi, LSD, which is not an acronym for uh, Let's Start Davening, okay? That's also a story of its own, which I won't go into now. Okay. So we had this intriguing conversations, but I realized I was, I was at a disadvantage. What was my disadvantage? I felt here I was sitting with a beard and a yarmulke, projecting not a neutral image, and I, I know I'm very sensitive. When you talk about communication and words, words are always loaded, stereotypes, myths. So I realized that even before I opened my mouth, who knows, they, I may remind them of some irrelevant Hebrew school teacher that taught them hollow uh, bar mitzvah lessons, or some angry grandfather that slept them to shul on Yom Kippur against their will, or even positive imagery, images, but it wasn't neutral. So I tried an experiment. As a writer, a communicator, I decided, you know what, I'm gonna use a new language. I'm not gonna use any references to anything Hebrew, religious, Torah-oriented. So instead of God, I used the word higher reality, or the essence of it all, or if it was a particularly new age group, I used words like, um, undefined layers of unconscious energy or something like that, you know? Instead of uh, Torah, I use the word blueprint. Instead of mitzvahs, connections. And instead of Geula Mashiach, what did I use? Destination. And there I was waxing eloquent and pontificating about connecting to the essence of everything, following this blueprint, making connections until we reach a point of the destination of total, utter, and seamless fusion between matter and spirit, form and function, body and soul, the inner and the outer, the superconscious and the conscious, in one intrinsic unity that will saturate the entire universe. That's the destination. And they were sitting there, and they were like, I saw, they were quite taken by it. And they're like, you know, wow, this is great stuff. And I was smiling to myself, a few weeks pass, and one of them, I remember, I don't know if you're old enough to remember, there was a group in the 60s called Jay and the Americans, a rock group. So one of the singers in that group was in my class, and he, he says to me at the beginning of the class, before most people came, he said, tell me, these last few weeks has been really mind-blowing. Are you talking about God? You know? <laughs> um, so I said, yes, but shh, don't spoil it for the others. And it worked. 
It worked better than I expected. Because words are loaded. This I also learned from the Rebbe, by the way. In editing his talks, the Rebbe, like uh, the scalpel of a surgeon, the precision, the necessity sometimes actually to be more ambiguous and not so black and white, was tremendous. A letter, a change of a word, a change of a letter. So I realized sometimes you have to speak in that language. So that's why I use the word destination, because destination, everybody loves destinations. We all want to reach a destination. You say Mashiach and Gula, some people say, ah, I heard that already. Or I don't want to get involved in politics or whatever it is. <laughs> I was. I was once at a cafe in the three weeks, and uh, there was no music being played. So there's a Jewish young guy. He says to the waitress, says, why, there's no, why is there no music? So his friend says to him, don't you know you're the son of a rabbi? This is the three weeks when the temples were destroyed. You know, the Babylonians destroyed the first temple, the Romans the second temple. So he says, I don't get involved in politics, okay? You know, Romans, Babylonians, you know. Most people, Mashiach, Geula, either the mean, word means nothing, or it's loaded and has all kinds of distorted meanings. Well, the, that simple meaning of it all is that life, history, each one of our lives is part of a destiny. We're going somewhere. Jews always knew that. That's what kept them alive. When they were Mitzrayim and suffering, they knew there's a destination. They were promised. We're going to the promised land. And then when the temples were destroyed and we went into Gullus, we knew we're going somewhere. And we dive in three times a day toward that place. Not just geographically, but spiritually, that we're going to a destination. And there will be an end. There is a light at the end of the tunnel, and it's not the light of the oncoming train. So if a life is driven by mission, every mission is going, is, what's the fulfillment of this mission? And this was, this saturated every word of the Rebbe's talks. From his first Fabring and the first formal assuming leadership, when he said, Bosse Legani Achesi Kala, Tov Shin Yud Aleph, 1951. Come to my garden, my sister, my bride. And what is the garden? That the world was once a garden and it will become a garden once again and a far greater one. There's a destination. And the Rebbe's words that were the seventh generation from the Alter Rebbe, as Moshe Rabbeinu was the seventh generation from Abraham. And what it was the seventh generation do, Moshe, he built a mishkan. He built a sanctuary, a temple, and we will merit to make this world into a temple for God and the Beis Amigdash in Yerushalayim. But the entire world will be a dira betachtenim a home for the divine. Now you think of it on its own, you'd say, wow, that's a big miracle for it to happen. No, but the Rebbe didn't see it that way. It's a process. History is a process. We don't believe as Geula is just an event that happens. It's an event at the end of a process. That every good deed and every mitzvah and every sacrifice done by every one of our grandparents and great-grandparents from the beginning of time, Adam and Eve in Garden of Eden is a building block that released energy into this world. We are materialistic people may not see that energy, but in some way change the universe. And accumulatively, if you think of it accumulatively, we have now billions and billions of these deeds. Where'd they all go? God forbid to say they died with the people that did them. So when someone says, hey, what difference does it make if I'm a good person or not, we all die anyway? No, the body dies, not the soul. And not the good deed, the Alter Rebbe says in Tanya, is forever. And the Rebbe, in a simple faith, doesn't require nothing revolutionary. Firmly believed, not just believed, but knew and saw that this accumulative energy has come to a point of eruption. And he shared that in 1951 and continued to share it throughout his leadership and made it very clear this will happen. Now, we all have questions why didn't it happen yet, then when, and so on. I'm not here to provide answers to things I don't know. But the vision does not change, the mission does not change, and the destination doesn't change. The only question that the Rebbe said we should ask ourselves is not when, what are you doing about it? What are you and I doing about it? So a destination-driven life means we're not just doing good deeds and mitzvahs and keeping Shabbos and kosher and coming together. It means that your life is filled with a vision toward where this is all headed to. And it's headed to a world that will make it all worth it because the world will finally live up to the purpose for which God created it. So if you think of it, like I said before, is this an original idea of the Rebbe? No, this is part and parcel of Judaism. If you believe in God, then you believe that God created a world with design. And he gave us a Torah, a blueprint, and connections to make this design apply and implement this design. 
Is there a, an end to the story? The answer is yes. So Mashiach is not just an addendum. It's the end to a long story. And we have the merit to be here today to do something about it. So on a personal level, yes, it's living a life. What is your goal? If you have a mission, there's also a goal in your mission. So you may ask me, since I'm the living, uh, walking guinea pig here, kosher guinea pig, I'll tell you personally how I apply this. When I learned, when I was 17 years old, as I shared the story, and then I didn't know what I'm good at, I didn't know what I'm bad, I didn't know anything. I just said, you know what, I want to be part of this. I want to be part of a revolution. Who knows? And then, in different ways, sometimes they seem accidental. I, I wrote this, I did that, and I realized I can write, I can speak. So what did I, that's, that's my mission, to use my skills as a writer, as a speaker, to communicate the message of Teirich Siddis through the lens of the Rebbe that I merited to sit at his feet, to help people find their calling and to find their mission and to do whatever it takes to reach this destination. And what is the destination personally? For me, and this I hope doesn't come across in the wrong ambitious way, I personally feel that if I and all of us do not reach billions of people, we have not succeeded. That doesn't mean, listen, when you touch one Jew, one soul, you save a universe. But still, from a perspective of, let's say, as an author, you want your book to be read more than one soul. You want more than one to read. You want millions to read it, billions to read it. And I'm not talking now about the royalties, which doesn't hurt, but that's not the reason. The reason is because that's how you reach people. Now, I can tell you, everybody has their own skills. Every one of you here in this room, as I said earlier, has your unique mission. The question is, one, do you have the courage to embrace it and act on it? And how are you going to use it to actually reach this destination called the Geula? And if someone says, I have no clue, you know, you, know that, you know what you do when you have no clue? Go speak to somebody. If you really care, find a mentor, find a friend. What do you do when you want to really achieve something, you don't know how to do it? You hire someone or you talk to someone. You don't just say, I don't know how, if you're truly committed. So I believe that here, 25 years, I like to think of it this way. The Rebbe sitting here with us gave us a calling. He was a gift given to us by God. A man who knew exactly what he has to do and taught us what we should be doing. And we have to give him a duch, a, uh, an accounting. And what do we say? 25 years have passed since God took your neshama from us, the, not from us, I should say, from the physical part of our lives, the physical body. So what have we done in these past 25 years? That's my question I ask myself. Now, of course, we could all pat ourselves on the back and say, I've done this and I've done that. But, you know, healthy people who are not just looking to feel good are always looking at what we haven't done, not what we've done. So, of course, we can sit and come here and give out awards and so on. I would like to say that insanity is doing the same thing and expecting different results. If you say, I'm doing everything I can, and you continue doing it, what do you think is going to happen? Obviously, God could have mercy, and he should have mercy, and finally bring Mashiach. But from our point of view as adults, and everything I said, for if, if, we, if the Rebbe infused us with mission and initiative and persistence and opportunities and all toward a destination, the question is a very direct one. What am I doing differently? And we don't need a new Torah. We don't need new mitzvahs, God forbid. But we need new initiatives. How to bring that Torah, how to bring those mitzvahs, how to bring chassidus to not just more people, quantitatively, but also qualitatively. That, to me, is the challenge of Gimel Tamas of this year, of every year. But here we are, 25 years. I find it shocking as 25 years. You know, we never thought we'd be here. But here we are. And instead of just sitting and talking about, hey, how, 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 what, what happened, what's going to be, that's not the language that I was trained, that we were trained by the Rebbe. The language is, what am I going to do about it? Now, I don't know if, if the Rebbe said that, I don't know what I can say more than the Rebbe himself. I'm just repeating the Rebbe's words. Do everything you can. Put your heads together. I assure you, anyone that respects the Rebbe would call you into his room and say, if you go to this and this business, I assure you you're going to make billions of dollars. I don't think you'd leave a stone unturned. You would meet every person on earth. You would consult with everybody. You would go to every attorney, every account, whatever. For some reason, I don't know if we take the same Mashiach quite that uh, personally that way. Maybe because it's more abstract, maybe it's more spiritual. But I'm not here to say Musra, I'm speaking to myself as I speak to you. And I want to say that's just a concluding note. I 
I live and breathe the Rebbe. It's my debt to him. Because I don't know who I would be today. I don't know if my soul would have a purpose. I don't know if I would have a cause. I may still be the rebellious young guy and just making trouble. I still try to make trouble, but good trouble, if you know what I mean. Disruption, as they say. So I have a tremendous debt that I never forget. Not a debt in a, in, with, with, with pleasure, with joy. Not a debt that I have to repay. Because I really feel a man that gave his life 24-7, and I saw with my own eyes that literally did not rest to fulfill this, this general mission and people's pers personal mission. I mean, the, the hours that the Rebbe would have that restraint and patience, like literally like a mother and a father to a little child who's spoiled or, or just mediocre or childish, that type of commitment of a man of that stature who paid such a price, to me, it would be a disgrace, an embarrassment if we didn't do everything possible to make sure that his mission is fulfilled. What hurts breaks my heart is when I speak to people that say, yeah, you Lubavitchers, okay, now you're one of us. Once you believed Mashiach was gonna come and you were doing everything, now it didn't work out, so now you join the club. We're going to kosher pizza tonight, or sushi, or hamburgers, or whatever it is. It breaks my heart because it's like when they see anti-Semites that say, yeah, where's your God? It's one of the worst things possible. Where's your God? Where's your great God when the Holocaust came or this happened or that happened? So I, for one, will say to you that I will not leave any stone unturned. This is the reason I come here, to be honest. Schlepping here is a long trip. But nevertheless, I feel that we have to all join forces and it's simply, I mean, the word disgrace is the word I would use. I don't like to use a negative word. It should be come from positive places. But yes, here's a man that was given to us by God a gift. How would I be without that? How would so many of us? How would the world be? So we have a real responsibility here because we are now the arms and legs of the Rebbe. We're the eyes and ears. We're the feet.